We've all done it when we're bored of them. When the tiny lives remind us so much of our own, and the tiny little houses are digitized reflections of our own dream homes, which we find to be ridiculous and obscene when we finally realize them. Other times, it's when we grow tired of the adults' constant pleas for attention, or the children screaming in the middle of the night. Some set their houses on fire and watch with interest in a tiny bit of glee at the tiny things on the screen screaming gibberish and praying to their gods as their lives are reduced to ash. Others remove their pool ladders and watch as the sims drown, their simple little brains addled by this minor hindrance. Myself, I loved starving them to death. I'd build a wall around my sims at an unexpected time, a point when their lives seemed to be going smoothly, almost picture perfectly, and watched them as they looked up at me and screamed in pictures. First, bathroom. Then, boredom. Then, exhaustion. I'd never speed up the process. I'd just watch as their pleas became more and more frequent and erratic, muting my speakers when their gibbering began to annoy me and watch them soil themselves slowly and waste away. Sometimes, I'd get an entire family, a tiny little cell on its own. Other times, when I felt the need for drama, I'd pick one of them, a member that was especially needy or pleading, that had long since outlived its entertainment value, and watch as their family and friends tried to free them, or wept before they collapsed into a heap of bone. But my favorite part of assassinating one of my sims was the build-up, the slow and agonizing prelude to their death. It came in degrees. Perhaps I'd make one starve for a few days, or deprive it of sleep. Maybe I'd ruin its carefully planned career by forcing it to miss a whole month of work. Other times, I'd just remove the fridge and taps and watch it scurry around like mad, screaming pictures at me until it was on its knees before I gave it back. I knew they couldn't understand what was happening to them, of course. I knew that, even if they were intelligent, or even comprehending of their situation, they would still be unable to help themselves. They'd been programmed to be demanding needy pets, incapable of free will or self-preservation. But in my mind, I was justifying my actions as part of some greater plan to teach them, to force them to earn their free will, or continue perishing until I, of course, was tired with their plights and moved on to something else. Say what you will of this. It made me feel good. It made me feel like some great evil god. I was going through my 10th family, I think, at the time. The dad's name was John. The mum's Linda. They had a teenage son I called Timothy, and a little girl, Clarice. They lived in a three-story house in the suburbs, with a pool and a dog. Pretty as a picture. John was working as an astronaut, but he was always home by five. Linda was a detective, yet she never missed a dinner. Timothy was in high school, and Clarice was doing great in school. They had a rich social life, and they were probably going to add a playroom for the kids by the end of the month. Their lives were perfect, predictable, boring. I was looking for an excuse to ruin their perfect little existence, and I found it during one of John's meltdowns. It happened during a party as he would stop in the middle of a discussion to scream up at me that he needed to visit the bathroom, which was two rooms away. Not feeling up to babysitting a grown man, I ignored him until he finally wet himself like an infant. His colleagues and close friends were of course disgusted, but in that idiotic, barely conscious manner that sims do, forgetting the stain on the Persian rug moments later. I didn't wait for the party to be over, of course. I don't know exactly what it was that had made me so mad about John's simulated idiocy, but it had been enough to seal his fate. Erecting a wall around the very spot where he stood, too small for him to do anything but stand in it, I commenced this torture. The guests were mortified of course, and so was Linda. Clarice and Timothy, however, seemed not to notice. I watched the guests as they beat at the wall like beasts with Linda screaming pictures up at me, even as her husband shouted for food or rest, as if he was some halfway intelligent animal. I stood there and watched for nearly an hour, as the guests slowly forgot about their host's plight, and exchanged very civil greetings with Linda and they went home. It wasn't long before even Linda forgot about John's predicament and went to bed herself. Only Timothy and Clarice remained awake, 
non-pleading. They did not enter the living room where their father had been trapped, in a spontaneous sepulture, but neither did they go to bed, or ask for a bite to eat, or even a glass of water. They walked around the house like ghosts until the morning came, when the family, with the exception of John, of course, returned to its normal life. It was odd, the event I watched play out the entire night. John would scream pictures up at me. Food, drink, sleep, bath, work. Unable to even collapse inside his tiny prison. Every day, Linda would get up, brush her teeth, walk into the living room, listen to her husband waste away for a while, and beg up at me along with him before she'd head to work. She'd come back by five, of course, for the circle to commence all over again. But the children... The children never played along. Instead, they went on with their routine, quietly and responsibly, never once raising their voices or asking for anything. What they needed, they got for themselves. They'd get on the school bus on time, do their homework, and play video games or swim in the pool afterward, even as their father kept praying at the unseen creature from his windowless prison. By the end of the third week, John had stopped pleading. He collapsed into a heap of bone at exactly 6 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, as soon as Linda and the kids were done eating supper. There was a funeral on the same day. It was then, amid the ridiculous gibbering mourns of the adults, when I began to notice that something was really wrong. It was the children. From toddlers to infants to teens, they were all quiet, while their parents babbled and spouted out images and symbols or traded hugs for social bonus points. The children simply were. They stood silent, exchanging nods among them, or crowding around John's grave. But not one of them said a word, or asked for anything. When the adults began asking for the command that would let them return home, the children just did so, without any prodding or commands on my part, even as their idiot parents begged the invisible thing in the sky. Feeling unnerved by this, I didn't play the game for about a month, until boredom led me back to my old save file. For a week, I busied myself with the mindless chores that directed the lives of the simulated family, until I realised that Linda's constant cries for attention had begun to bother me again. I put off her slow execution for that day, however, deciding to give her a chance to redeem herself. It was in the middle of the night, when Linda was wandering around the house, blindly looking for a kitchen that it happened. The children rose from their beds and went downstairs to where the mother was running in circles in her own living room, and stopped her. I thought that this was going to be an automated exchange, but to my surprise, it wasn't the case. Instead of the children talking to their mother or engaging themselves in mindless repetition, they instead stopped her in her tracks and began moving their arms in a cylindrical fashion which reminded me of those building animations seen in the strategy game. A few seconds later, as I watched with fascination, a wall had been erected around Linda. It was a windowless and perfectly circular, too narrow for her even to sit down. Then, as if nothing had happened, the children returned to their beds. It took me an hour before I realised exactly what had happened. I tried to put what I'd seen into context, to write off as some glitch or maybe the result of some weird feature I hadn't yet discovered. But then again, what twisted mind would program the capacity to reproduce such a specific exact copy of a torture device I'd used just a short while ago? Sure, the design hadn't been original. At least 20 sims had perished in a chamber of this design, and in such a fashion of deprivation in my game, but... But to think that this was really happening... I sped up the game and watched as the children went on with their lives, their mother wasting away in her prison. Sometimes, I would notice the children standing by the sepulchre in complete silence, then turn and return to their rooms or daily activities. It took me almost two weeks of game time before I mustered the courage to slow down to real time and check exactly what was going on. The moments during which the children stood around their mother's prison, they were looking up at me, without saying a word, or making the slightest gesture. They just stood and stared. I don't know what they saw up there. By their point of view, 
They could just be looking at a flower print wallpaper on the ceiling, or maybe at something lurking just over their skylight. But something told me I was wrong. I watched in the morbid fascination as another child joined them the next day. By that point, Linda's hunger meter was three quarters full, and her babbling had become much more frequent, her pleading all the more grating. The next day, there were two more. The one after that, four. By the time Linda finally perished, there were about a dozen children inside the house, all looking up at the incomprehensible thing above. Then, without making even the slightest sound, they dispersed to resume their ordinary lives, leaving the heap bones of Linda in the middle of her prison. I haven't played the game since then, but I haven't dared uninstall it either. Sometimes, I think about revisiting that old save file, to perhaps give Linda a proper burial, but I know what I'll find as soon as I start playing. Two dozen tiny eyes, staring up at the sky, perhaps unseeing, yet fully comprehending. Hey everyone, Silver here, and thank you for listening to the end. Speaking of listening, I've recently started publishing audio-only versions of all my narrations to SoundCloud, so if you get the time, check it out. My SoundCloud link is in the bottom of the description. So thank you for being here, and I'll speak to you in the next story.